I'm Andrew Hollenbach, Associate Professor in the Department of Genetics at Louisiana State University Health Sciences Center in New Orleans. Today I'm interviewing Dr. Scott Leibowitz, Head Child and Adolescent Psychiatrist in the Gender and Sex Development Program at the Ann and Robert H. Laurie Children's Hospital of Chicago and Assistant Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, Northwestern University, Feinberg School of Medicine. Scott, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. So if you could just tell us what is gender identity and how does it develop and or change over time? Okay. Gender identity is something that is one's internal perception or subjective sense of self uh, along the gender continuum from male to female. Um, it's how someone might think of themselves being male, how someone might think of themselves as being female, or even some aspects of being male and female and or an alternative gender. Um, gender identity does have uh, different uh, meanings over time, depending on developmental age of the people that we're seeing. Um, in children, um, gender identity and gender nonconformity um, are two aspects of development that could be conflated very easily. Gender nonconformity is more about gender role and gender expression. Um, and how someone acts within a certain society as masculine or feminine. So how one feels gender identity versus how one expresses themselves gender expression are the key points here. And in children, um, there's not quite as much known exactly about um, how gender identity exactly is formed for a given person. Um, in some, it may be a biological construct born at birth with a certain gender identity, and in others, it may be the result of environmental experiences. Quite honestly, people don't understand gender identity development and when it varies um, exactly. So with kids, um, the key here is to not assume, is to not make assumptions that what that child uh, may express necessarily means that that is how that child will feel moving forward. Um, in adolescence, things change. With um, physical development and puberty, maturation, um, that involves the development of sex, uh, secondary sexual characteristics, um, leading to a man or woman's body. Um, adolescents have a better understanding of what their gender and what their gender identity is and who they may be. Um, and individuals who understand um, and have studied gender identity variants over the course of the lifespan um, look to adolescence and puberty as a time when um, gender identity is more consolidated. So for example, a child who is born um, with a male body saying, I am a girl, um, they may be a girl later on in life, but they may also uh, be conflating um, gender role and gender identity and liking the, um, or preferring the role of the opposite gender. Um, whereas an adolescent who says, I am a girl, born a boy, it's probably more likely. Again, in adolescence, there's also a period of identity exploration that takes place, especially with the internet nowadays um, and other um, uh, social media aspects where people along the gender spectrum are presenting. Um, there's gender identities that are more so in the middle. Adolescents are taking on terms like gender queer, um, and they're using other terms um, such as pansexual to describe their sexual orientation. Um, and so while adolescence is certainly a time uh, where gender identity is more consolidated than it would be in childhood, uh, we also still work with evolving identity exploration in adolescence. And then in adults and beyond, um, things seem to be more consolidated as one gets older. So you had mentioned terms like gender nonconforming and pansexual. What are some of the other terms that are used to describe gender identity within the LGBT community? And why is it important for clinicians to be aware of this when they're treating these patients? It's important to think about terminology and the difference between the way science and the literature and physicians use terminology and the way patients use terminology, um, specifically when we're thinking about 
um, identities and also thinking about experiences. And so understanding how a, an adolescent may use a term, for example, genderqueer or pansexual are typically colloquial terms nowadays, not necessarily used in the literature. Pansexual being a sexuality-based term referring to um, kids who have attractions or um, sexual behavior experiences with others who are on the full gender spectrum as opposed to bisexuality, which is those who are attracted to males and females. Um, that's one new term that's being used by the youth these days. Gender queer being those who don't necessarily identify um, as transgender or cisgender. Cisgender being individuals whose anatomies and minds uh, are actually congruent with one another. So how we use terms is really important and not using clinical terms with patients is also important and understanding that by um, eliciting how a patient feels um, will help us understand whether they're um, feeling a certain identity experience or whether they are um, experiencing something that may not necessarily be an identity that is lifelong. And we cannot make assumptions about who people will be in the future, uh, especially when we don't know um, how their identities will evolve. How can health professionals create clinical environments to support gender nonconforming and transgender individuals? Okay, well, um, healthcare environments really need to be more inclusive of individuals who don't fit uh, the typical boxes of the male, female binary that societies uh, typically used uh, to define gender. Um, ways in which that can be improved would be having uh, bathrooms in the clinic. Uh, that people can feel comfortable using, whether it be a gender neutral bathroom or bathrooms that don't have a gender designation. Um, staff need to be trained about when it's appropriate to use a certain pronoun, when it's appropriate to use a name that might not actually match the medical record or a legal record. Physicians and other associated healthcare workers need to understand how to document uh, patients' preferences uh, in a, a respectful way. Um, so just because a patient might have a legal name that indicates what their gender uh, was at birth doesn't mean that that's how the patient feels now. And one can very clearly document up in the beginning of any note a pronoun and name use section that justifies w using a name that is a patient's preference when it differs from the medical record. These things can also be extended to prescriptions and telling pharmacies, please use this patient's preferred name uh, when interacting with the patient or when using the patient bottle. Um, electronic medical records need to be uh, gathering data that differentiates between one's anatomy and one's gender and not make assumptions that the term gender alone, male, female, indicates that a person um, is that way. A person shouldn't have to choose to go with what their body and anatomy represents from what their mind represents when that differs. And for the entire, uh, uh, most of society where those things don't differ necessarily, uh, one would never think to have to do something extra. Um, but in order to make a healthcare environment inclusive uh, for gender nonconforming and transgender individuals, Really, this is about um, improving the healthcare environment for all people. So, following up on that, what, what resources are available to healthcare professionals who want to get more information, or where would they go to get this necessary training? I think a, a very important and valuable resource for all healthcare professionals across disciplines would be the World Professional Association for Transgender Health's uh, most recent standards of care. Um, presently, that, that edition is the seventh edition. Um, it has a very comprehensive description of uh, various disciplines' roles in the lives of transgender health, uh, people who are transgender and people who are gender nonconforming. Um, it provides indications and um, risks, benefits of the various uh, affirming interventions that exist for transgender individuals. Um, another 
really valuable resource would be the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry's um, LGBT practice parameter. Um, it gives nine principles on how to approach uh, child and adolescents and their development with regard to gender and sexuality. Um, various uh, organizations and LGBT-related groups have put forth uh, reports that highlight the disparities that LGBT people have faced. And I think understanding those disparities and understanding how people have been treated is very important in order to understand the directions and future changes that people need to make to use uh, to create you know, a positive uh, improvement in the practices and lives of gender nonconforming and transgender individuals in the future. Um, there are other advocacy uh, organizations, for example, uh, the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Educators Network, or GLSEN, would be a great organization for people, doctors, to use when interacting with schools and educators to help make uh, kids' lives better and improving the school climates uh, that their kids are being uh, raised in uh, to allow uh, teachers to know when to intervene uh, if bullying comes up for a child or adolescent who's being targeted for being gender nonconforming or transgender. Um, so really there's a fair amount of resources out there and more coming and I think that it starts with recognizing that we need to make a change um, and that these changes are not just applicable to the gender nonconforming and transgender populations we're dealing with, they're really applicable to everybody. And they really improve the lives of everybody because they, they help everybody realize that there are people that are not like them and that teaches everybody to um, appreciate uh, and respect diversity. So where and how can these issues about transgender and non gender nonconforming health be taught in medical education? Oh, well, that's a, a very big question that's important. Um, I think these issues are not necessarily needing to be taught um, in a separate chapter or in a separate uh, rotation. Uh, we don't need to add time to curricula in order to um, educate people on uh, issues related to gender nonconformity and transgender health. They really need to be integrated where they are most appropriate, where the curricula already focuses on issues related to gender. Um, so we don't need to create extra time. For example, in an endocrine unit, we can be talking about uh, hormones, just the way we would talk about thyroid treatments, or just the same way we would talk about um, diabetes and insulin. We would be talking about testosterone and estrogen in relation to some individuals who uh, that is a very valuable and life-saving treatment. Um, in a child development uh, course or psychiatry rotation, one can focus on what gender identity means across the lifespan, specifically from childhood into adolescence, into young adulthood, and beyond. Um, I think in an embryology lecture, one can focus on sex anatomy mm -hmm. and how um, various uh, um, parts of embryological development may lead to some issues or you know whether it be um, issues related to enzyme deficiencies, receptor abnormalities um, in how people who are born with DSD um, uh, may experience the world. That can be taught into an embryo embryology lecture or a health care policy lecture can focus in on discrimination just as it does when we're talking about ethnic diversity, we're also, uh, there's an ample opportunity to talk about sexual and gender diversity. So finding where uh, these uh, points are raised in the curriculum um, is, is really the task at hand and not creating a new curriculum for LGBT and DSD related issues, but actually um, integrating it into where things already exist. Any last thoughts that you'd like to mention? Um, I think it's important for the medical community to realize uh, that transgender individuals and the gender nonconforming populations, um, they have been uh, persecuted against, and they've been persecuted against by the medical community mm -hmm. for a long time. Um, 
for example, even within my own um, professional discipline, um, that of psychiatry, historically, um, variants of, of, of gender expression and gender identity have been pathologized in the DSM. And I think that, th that approaching patients who have um, a mistrust already for uh, the medical community really uh, is important for us as medical providers to, to, to know that. And it's important for us to approach people with sensitivity and understanding and, and respect in a way that um, creates a climate that is inclusive of all. And also to know that the fields are evolving. And um, for example, even within the field of psychiatry, from the DSM-4, which characterized um, being transgender as having gender identity disorder, the term alone really conceptualizes um, being transgender as being um, a disorder. And I think it's, take, it's moved away from pathologizing an identity to gender dysphoria, which really takes an experience, um, that disjunction that I explained, and gives it um, a way for helping individuals access care. And so recognizing and not using um, the way we classify these things in, in the psychiatric manual for, for, for mental illness as meaning that an identity has a pathology because that promotes the mistrust that many transgender people already have. Instead, recognizing this is a way to help people get care, get sensitive care, be respected, and um, have us medical professionals really ally with our patients and understand why they may be mistrusting of us to begin with. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.